Okay, lecture 21, part 2. This is section 5.3, discussing enthalpy. So when we left off, we just uh, concluded that at constant pressure, delta H, change in enthalpy, is equal to Q, which means by measuring the change in temperature, you have measured um, a state function, okay, the change in a state function, which means that whereas Q ordinarily looks at one, oops, that looks one path, because, you know, we you know, played around with our formulas and so on, you know, set limiting conditions and what have you, uh, now we know that it's true for any path. Okay. So long as you're at constant pressure, then measuring delta T tells you about the change in energy, no matter how you get from A to B. We often use enthalpy to talk about energy changes in thermochemical equations. Those are just reactions like this one, H2 plus one half O2, gas, gas, goes to form H2O liquid with a delta H for that reaction is being equal to negative 285.8 kilojoules per mole. So let's talk about uh, some conventions for uh, these thermochemical equations. One, that is the delta H for the reaction as written. So that's negative 285.8 kilojoules released, I should say, by every, for every one mole of H2O formed. Or negative 285.8 kilojoules for every half mole of O2 consumed. Okay, so that's something that you have to be careful of because that would mean uh, negative 500 and uh, da, 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 70, oops, 71.6 kilojoules for every one mole of oxygen consumed. Okay, so our next convention is closely related. Okay, um, changes to the reaction change the enthalpy of the reaction. So sticking with our reaction, H2 plus one half O2 makes H2O. Delta H is equal to negative 285.8. If you double the reaction, that means you double the enthalpy. So that would get you 2H2 plus O2 yields 2H2O with delta H equals negative 571.6 kilojoules per mole, kilojoules per mole. Okay. If you tripled the reaction, you would triple the enthalpy, quadruple, quadruple, and so on. The other thing is you reverse the reaction. That's negative, oops, let's make that clear, negative one times delta H. Okay, so however much energy is released by a reaction, if you reverse the reaction, then you have to put that much energy in to get it to happen. Okay, so take this reaction again, multiply it by negative one. What that means is now instead of making H2O, we're breaking H2O, okay? We're, we're breaking it apart. And making H2O releases a lot of energy. You have to put that energy in to decompose it, okay? So delta H is now equal to positive 285.8 kilojoules per mole. Uh, those conventions will be uh, big important uh, later on. And not too much later on, almost immediately, they'll be important. You have to remember 
Uh, when you multiply the reaction, when you have the reaction happening multiple times is what that means, you get more energy out or you have to put more energy in. Okay, So that's what this means up here. Doubling the reaction means the reaction happens twice. So if the reaction happens twice, you get twice the energy out. Similarly, reversing the reaction um, just means that you're doing the action in reverse. Okay, Instead of putting things together, you're taking them apart. Stuff like that. Convention 2, phase matters a lot. Okay, So H2 gas plus one half O2 gas goes to form H2O uh, liquid delta H is equal to negative 285.8. But H2 gas plus one half O2 gas makes H2O gas delta H is equal to negative 242 kilojoules. Why is that? Well, because to get something to be a gas, you have to put energy in. And it takes roughly 43 uh, kilojoules per mole to uh, vaporize liquid water. You have to put energy in to make that happen. So producing liquid gas makes gives you more energy than producing, or sorry, producing liquid water uh, releases more energy than producing gaseous water. That's why, um, for example, fuel cells inside cars are trying to make them liquid fuel cells, you know, producing liquid water, because it makes for a more efficient transfer of energy. Okay, you could just make hydrogen and oxygen, put them in cylinders and blow them up, just like we do with cars today, but that would be, you know, somewhat less efficient. They're hoping for um, a more efficient, a more powerful, uh, just a better uh, kind of fuel cell. Also, quieter. And finally, the last thing we're looking at, uh, sign convention uh, stays the same. Sign is the same, oops, the same as for heat. So delta H less than zero means you're releasing heat to the surroundings, and that is exothermic delta H, oops, Delta H greater than zero is endothermic. You're having to put heat in, okay, to uh, 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 for the reaction in that case. Okay, now let's move on and talk about Hess's law. No idea who Hess was. Don't really care. Okay, say you want to get from A to Z. And you want to find out what is the delta H for that reaction. But you can't easily measure you know, the temperature change for the reaction A to Z. You know, the, the reaction is just not conducive to measuring change in temperature. Okay, it's uh, wildly acidic and it dissolves thermometers, let's say. Option one, you could just give up, but we'll never do that. So instead, what we'll do is we'll go from A to B, from B to C, from C to, oops, to D, then to E, and that will take us to Z. We can measure this delta H, and 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 remember, delta H is a state function, so we don't care about the path. So delta H for our reaction is equal to delta H1 plus delta H2 plus delta H3 plus delta H4 plus delta H5. No matter what path you take, as long as you get from A to B, or sorry, A to Z, uh, in some fashion. So that's what we do with Hess's Law of Problems. Or, in fact, that's what we do in the laboratory. You know, if there's ever any reaction 
where it's difficult to measure a state function directly with that reaction, we just find some path where we can measure whatever it is we want to measure, and that'll do it. Doesn't matter if it's 20 steps, doesn't matter if it's two steps, so long as it gets us there. So let's look at H2O gas plus SO3 gas makes H2SO4 gas. What is the delta H of this reaction? And the reactions we have are H2S plus O2, both gases make H2SO4 liquid with delta H1 equals negative 235.5 kilojoules. Next up we have H2S gas plus O2 gas makes SO3 gas plus H2O gas delta H2 dang it this is also not a gas it's a liquid and delta H2 is negative 207.0 kilojoules and finally H2O makes H2O liquid to gas delta H3 is equal to 44 kilojoules. So what we need to do is we need to find some way to rearrange these three uh, reactions. Rearrange these to get what we have up on top. It's uh, nowhere near as difficult as you might think. What you do is you look at your reactants and your products and you say, okay, what side are they on? What side are they on down here? And then just flip, multiply, do whatever you have to do to get things in the right position in the right numbers. Simply stated, sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's easy. Now in this case, we have one H2SO4 as a product. We have one H2SO4 as a product. So reaction one, we leave as it is, or just multiply by one. Okay, We don't have to change it at all. Okay? Now reaction two, we have SO3 and we have H2O, but they're on the wrong side. They're on the product side. So that means we need to flip this reaction around, which means multiply by negative one. But then that gives us liquid water on the right, or sorry, on the left as a uh, reactant. We need to cancel that out to get, so that means getting this liquid water down here on the other side, and doing that will get us gaseous water on the reactant side, which is what we want. So we want to flip this reaction around as well. We're multiplying reaction three by negative one. Okay, so this one is the same. These two get flipped. So let's see what that means. So H2S gas plus O2 gas makes H2SO4 liquid delta H equal to negative 235.5 kilojoules. And this next one we flipped, that's H2O liquid plus SO3 gas makes H2S gas plus O2 gas. Delta H is equal to positive 207.0 kilojoules. And finally, we flipped reaction three, H2O gas goes to H2O liquid, with delta H is negative 44, zero kilojoules. Now remember back to balancing your redox reactions or uh, your precipitation reactions, making the, uh, the net ionic equation. Anything that appears on both sides of the arrow gets canceled out. 
And that's exactly what we're doing here when we add these three equations together. So, reaction 1 has H2S on the left, reaction 2 has it on the right. So it goes bye-bye. Similarly, we have oxygen on the left and on the right. And then, coming down here to reactions 2 and 3, we have a liquid water on the left and right, and it goes away as well. And nothing else appears on both sides of the equation, and what that gets us is H2O gas plus SO3 gas makes H2SO4 liquid. That is the equation we were hoping to get. So, boom. That's what we want. Okay, this was a fairly simple equation, or uh, a Hess's Law problem, because there's times 1, times negative 1, times negative 1. They can get more complicated than that. I won't throw anything too hideously complicated at you, unless I've screwed up. Okay, so now, to get delta H for the reaction, we just add up these three. So negative 235.5 plus 207.0 plus negative 44.0 is equal to negative 72.5 kilojoules. And yes, if you're curious, this is something that can happen. Sulfur trioxide plus water, um, they will combine in the air to form sulfuric acid. And that is one component, for those of you old enough to remember it, of acid rain. It was a, a bad thing. Um, and it's just because sulfur is present as an impurity in some kinds of coal. And thus, you know, when you burned those kinds of coal, you ended up with sulfur trioxide in the air, and that would combine with water to make sulfuric acid. Um, it wasn't, you know, like hugely concentrated sulfuric acid, but it was enough to cause damage to buildings, uh, to, to roads, to ancient statues and works of art that were located outside. Uh, made a lot of people very unhappy. And it also caused environmental damage. It was pretty unpleasant. Um, so that's why uh, coal-fired uh, power plants um, now have to have a you know chemical scrubber inside the smokestack in order to remove uh, the, the sulfur trioxide. And also, to a lesser degree, sulfur dioxide, um, which would make H2SO3 a weak acid, but still an acid. All right, um, so uh, that is one example. I'm going to write out another example for you real quick. Okay, the reaction you're looking for is into H4 liquid plus hydrogen gas makes ammonia liquid. Okay, uh, if you're curious, uh, into H4 is hydrazine. It's a form of rocket fuel. Uh, this is actually a gas, and there are two of them. What is delta H for this reaction? And the uh, different reactions we have to play with, we have hydrazine plus methanol yields formaldehyde, nitrogen, and hydrogen, gas, and gas, uh, with delta H being equal to negative 37 kilojoules. Next up, we have our old favorite, nitrogen plus hydrogen yields ammonia with delta H equal to negative 46 kilojoules. And finally, methanol can be broken apart to yield formaldehyde and hydrogen gas with an enthalpy of negative 65 kilojoules. Now, I recommend you go ahead and pause it here and try and work this out on your own real quick. And then unpause it, and I'll show you the answer. Welcome back. I'm assuming you paused it. Now, let's go ahead and figure this out. We need everything to be on the right-hand side. It is entirely possible that you can confuse and freak yourself out by focusing on hydrogen. Okay. 
um, because it appears in all three equations. It's on different sides of different reactions. I recommend you ignore hydrogen and trust that it'll work itself out. Instead, focus on the hydrazine and the ammonia. Okay, These need to be on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, respectively. And, oh, look at that. They already are. So that means go ahead and leave these two reactions exactly as they are. Don't do anything to reactions one or two. Instead, now we look at reaction three, because reaction three is going to let us get rid of methanol and formaldehyde. We have methanol in reaction one and formaldehyde in reaction one. We need to get rid of those. So let's go ahead and flip this reaction around. And we don't need to change the numbers, just multiply by negative one. Okay. So when we do that, that's going to get us these reactions. Well, let's just go ahead and erase really quick. Formaldehyde plus hydrogen can yield methanol. I'm assuming that's a very uncommon reaction. And it's an endothermic reaction. Okay, so when we combine these, what happens? So formaldehyde gets canceled out. Our methanol gets canceled out. Nitrogen gets canceled out. Now we have an oddity with our hydrogen. I'm going to have to go back and edit it in, into an earlier bit because um, I made a mistake here copying this down. Um, this is actually three hydrogen. No. Okay, so I'm going to have to go back and put this earlier in the video to point out that it's three hydrogen in that particular uh, spot. And hope that it doesn't screw you up too badly uh, when you try to solve this reaction. Okay, and anyway, that cancels out three of the hydrogen on the left and leaves one. So when we add these three together, what that leaves us with is N2H4 liquid plus hydrogen gas yields to ammonia gas. Hooray! Okay, which leaves us with an enthalpy of reaction of negative 18 kilojoules. And that is how you solve Hess's Law problems. You know, uh, just flip the reactions around as necessary, multiply them as necessary. These two examples were somewhat simpler. You know, it was just uh, multiplying by one or negative one. Um, but they can get more complicated. You can multiply by two or three or four, possibly uh, one half if I give you a really nasty one. So let's go ahead and call this uh, portion of lecture 21 finished.